Welcome to BugCard University. Today we're going to talk about Burp Suite, an application testing tool suite that helps pen testers and bug hunters alike. My name is Jason Haddix, and I'm the VP of Trust and Security here at BugCrowd. I'm a father, hacker, blogger, and gamer, and I'll be presenting today's module for you. So the first section we're going to talk about is setting up your browser to use Burp. So the first thing we're going to talk about here is browser profiles. Browser profiles are useful when using an interception proxy for a couple of reasons. First, they allow you to have a completely clean state slate to start with. What this means is that your normal browsing has extensions that you've added in that browser. It has uh, home pages that you've set for the browser to visit when you first open it up. There's just going to be a lot of traffic coming from that browser that could clog up your project files when you're doing a security testing project. So we want to create a new browser profile so that we don't have any of this cluttering up our project files. Another powerful reason to have a browser profile is that you can run two instances of Chrome, one for your application testing profile and one for your normal traffic profile, and have them both open at the same time and only one route through Burp. This means that your normal browser profile that's open, you can go ahead and Google things, which is part of the normal workflow of application testing, visit your favorite injection cheat sheets, make sure you're looking at stuff on GitHub, etc. And then the other one doesn't uh, do that. It's just for interacting with the site that you're going after. This makes sure that you don't clog Burp with all kinds of standard web traffic. And even though we have the scoping tool, which we're going to talk about later, it just helps Burp not to get bogged down. To create a profile in each respective browser, there should be a tab in the upper right-hand corner of the window. It'll show your current profile name. If you click on it, then there should be some semblance of a way to manage the users for your browser or create a new profile. You can go to Manage People in Chrome and go ahead and create a new profile. I've already created one here that I'm using called Horse Tester, which I'll be using for the remainder of this project. Horse Tester has limited extensions installed and none of my normal home pages or background traffic to clog up my project. There are several Chrome and Firefox plugins or extensions that exist that can help a security tester. You'll probably want a fast proxy switching extension though for your new profile. This will allow you to quickly instrument turning the browser to point towards Burp before it points towards the internet. And this will allow Burp to pick up all the traffic that goes through it. There's actually probably close to hundreds of these extensions and plugins that you might specifically want to use inside of your browser. Now, since this is a Burp training, we're not going to talk about all of them. And in the introductory module, we talked about a few of them. Some more represented here are a couple of technology profile scripts and plugins built with technology profile, Profiler, Wappalyzer, and What Runs will all help you figure out what your site is running so that you have a better sense of what you're hacking. There's also OpenList and Link Clump, which are just general browser helper tools that allow you to open and create lists of tabs from other tools. And then Link Clump allows you to manually open a lot of links on a site into new tabs. And then, of course, the one that we referenced already, Foxy Proxy, which allows you to switch the browser to use Burp inline. Foxy Proxy also allows me to set up different proxy profiles. Here I have one profile set up for Burp, which routes all traffic to 127.0.0.1, port 8080. And this is the default proxy listener for Burp. I could also set up multiple profiles here, maybe one for Zap or another application testing tool that wants me to route the browser through it in order to achieve some kind of crawl or, or something else for the application. When it's time to switch the browser over to using Burp, you just click the Fox icon in the upper right hand corner and choose use Burp for all URLs. It's also recommended sometimes that you have a VPN ready when you're doing this type of application security testing. What tends to happen is when you're testing certain clients who have inline web application firewalls or content delivery networks that ban you for using bad traffic, what they'll do is they'll put you on this global blacklist and then uh, you'll wonder why you can't get to certain sites or why you can't connect to certain sites it's because they use the same global blacklist. These are uh, companies like Akamai and Cloudflare and things like that. So having a VPN where you can test over and not worry about getting banned or something like that is really useful. I, at home, use IP Vanish. Now we're going to talk a little bit about setting up Burp. Now that we've got the browser running through Burp, we actually need to fire up Burp itself. And the first thing we want to do when we get into Burp is generate our certificate and install the certificate either into our browser or a system. Now, to see HTTPS traffic, we need to generate the certificate and install it somehow. If 
Firefox has the ability to scope the certificate just to the browser. So you can install a custom certificate in, directly into Firefox. Chrome, on the other hand, needs you to install a system-wide certificate. The way to do that is to head under the proxy tab into options and then click import export CA certificate. You can then choose the export certificate DIR format and save it as a file onto your desktop. You can name this file when you're exporting it anything that you want dot cert. This will save a certificate to the desktop. It'll have an icon that looks like a certificate. You double click on that. The system will prompt you to install that certificate. You want to make it a trusted certificate and that way Burp will allow you to man in the middle and your browser will allow you to man in the middle HTTPS traffic uh, through the proxy. So now that you have Burp running and if you try to go to some traffic, you'll notice that maybe nothing's happening in your browser. And this is actually one of the things that happens to testers all the time, it's not just you, is we forget that when Burp starts by default, it starts with interception turned on. That means that any traffic that's trying to route through Burp, if you have everything set up correctly, is getting stopped. Now you can go to the proxy tab and then the options tab under the proxy tab. Make sure that your proxy is running. There's a check mark there and make sure it's running. Uh, the check mark indicates that the proxy is running and then the interface that it's running on. Then if you go to proxy and intercept tab, you can see that the intercept button might be pressed in. Now, if you press intercept is on, if you press that button, it'll start allowing traffic through the proxy. This happens all the time, so don't worry about it. It happens to the best of us. Now we're gonna talk about actually proxying targets and using the core tools inside of Burp. All right, so now we're gonna do a quick demo of Burp. Now on the left-hand side of my screen split, I have my browser set up on my horse tester browser profile. And on the right-hand side, I have Burp. So the first thing I've made sure to do is go to the proxy tab and intercept, and make sure that intercept says it's off. I can turn it on, I can turn it off. Now remember, by default, it starts on. I also just wanna make sure my proxy is running. If I go to options, here you can see that I do have it running, it's checked, and it's running on the correct interface. So, we will begin to try to proxy some traffic. Here I have a sample website I've set up to demo burp. Now the first thing that you'll notice is I'm in the target tab and two domains have showed up in my target tab now. Now the first one was Google and because Chrome's default page is a search page, uh, as soon as I started typing my URL, into the URL bar, it started to predictively try to return search results to me. But I went and referenced the main domain for umbrellacorpinternal.com port 8881 uh, directly and pressed enter and then so it gave me the site once this site resolved. Now here I have a general site that could be any site. It's got a username uh, and password field which indicates a login. Um, and here we have burp on the right hand side. So under each one of these top level domains, you can click the arrow here and drill down into what Burp has seen for each one of these applications or domains, what traffic. And in the sitemap, you can now see that the only thing I've requested for Umbrella Corp internal is the root resource. Now, if I put in a name here and a password and choose submit, you now see that this turns to a gear icon. I can drill down into that gear icon and now you can see that I have sent a request that was a post request to the server. And if I click on that, on the right hand side, you get a contents window and a request and response section. Now the site tree is built to show you and separate out domains. Here you can see umbrella internal and everything I've seen for it and Google and everything I've seen for it. Now, when I click in this top level here, these are all the requests for umbrella internal that exist ever that I've made. If I click down here, this is everything for the root resource, and then these are all post requests to the root resource under that tree. Burp has several designations for icons in the site tree. The gear icon means that something is dynamic, meaning you send data to that resource. The message envelope indicates you sent something, usually a post request. 
pages are indicated by a white page icon and paths are indicated by a folder icon. You can also view your proxy traffic in the proxy tab and HTTP history. This will give you a list of all of the sites that you've requested in chronological order. Now here you can see my numbers start at 80, but yours will probably start at one. I've been using Burp to set up the demo, so they're higher numbers here. Uh, but 76 was my first request to Google. You'll see those. And then subsequently I went to umbrellacorpeternal.com. And these are the subsequent requests I made there. Now you'll see if I refresh this page, another request will go by. If I do a new login for something else, another request will go by. And this chronologically will build your request traffic history out. Now, what's useful when you're using Burp is to actually funnel the newest requests to the top. So you can just sort by request number by clicking here and making sure that your newest requests uh, are funneling themselves to the top. And this gives you a good representation when you're looking at traffic to understand what's going on live. Now there are a multiple of columns under the HTTP history tab, what host it was, what method was used, the exact URL, if it had parameters, uh, if you edited it with one of the tools inside Burp, the status of the return uh, code, uh, the length and the MIME type, etc. These are all helpers for you to basically understand what the application is doing and eyeball uh, if you need to request something manually or dive into any specific request. All right, let's recap the target tab. The target tab is an overarching tree style view of all the websites that are in scope for your project. Icons designate what type of content each node is, and you can select a single path to only see requests you've made in that area. Now included in Burp Suite is this idea of a scope of a project, and that's the next area we're gonna explore in Burp Suite. So when you're doing a project, you may want to tell Burp that you only want to view traffic and requests inside of your target, your proxy, and other tools in Burp by using something like a scope. And what a scope allows you to do is set a host or a keyword or an IP range to tell the whole proxy that this is the only thing that you care about and the only thing you want to see. So to set a scope, you first head over to the target tab and then the scope tab. Now under here, you have some options. You can explicitly add a domain, fully qualified domain, or if you want to use a regex or a keyword, you can check the box that says use advanced scope control and click add. Now when you do this, you can put in any keyword. Now the reason I use keywords many times instead of explicit domains when I'm setting up a custom scope for the first part of my application testing is because I actually wanna see when I'm browsing one site if I visit other sites that belong to a target. Now here I'm just putting an umbrella, which is the target application that we looked at a couple minutes ago. This will, when I apply the scope to any of these windows, allow me to filter on anything that just says umbrella uh, in the domain. All right, so here I am in my scope tab under target and scope. And now I'm going to go ahead and use the example that we did in the slides. I'm going to click the box here and choose add. Now here I'm going to say umbrella as a keyword and say okay. And I will say yes here as well. So now I've added uh, a scope rule. This says that any protocol that has the keyword umbrella in it will show up when I filter a tool. Uh, by scope. So let me show you exactly what that looks like. Here we are back at our site tab, and you can see that we have Google and Umbrella Corp. Now, I know as a application tester that I am not testing Google right now. Uh, so I don't want to see Google in either my site tree or my proxy history. So what I can do now is go to these individual tools and tell them but I only want to see in scope items. So here at the top of each window is what I call the filter ribbon or the filter bar. You can click on this filter ribbon and it brings down a whole bunch of options to how you filter what you see inside this specific tool. And Burp is really a tool suite made out of individual tools. So right now I'm, I'm inside the target tool 
and inside the sitemap tool, which is a, a viewing tool. Now, what I want to do here is say, hey, I only want to show in scope items. And I've set my scope to say, I only want to see things that have umbrella in the domain name. So I will check this box. You can check and uncheck this box and then click out of this window. And now you can see that Google has disappeared. And all that remains is my umbrella site. Now, had I found other URLs with umbrella in them or domains that had umbrella in them, they would show up here as well because that's what I'm searching. And I can go ahead and look at proxy and history and do the same thing here. You'll, not you'll notice that HTTP history also has a filter bar. And you can click here and show only in scope requests and then click out. And now we only have our umbrella corp internal addresses. Now there's a ton of other filter options. So you can restrict different MIME types from the views and filter those out. You can only look at certain status codes if you'd like. Uh, you can filter by search terms, uh, things that don't have parameters or show only parameterized requests. You can filter by file extensions. There's a lot of power inside of Burp's filter bar or filter ribbon. Uh, and this filter ribbon exists on a lot of tools. If I go back to target, I can go back here and you can see it has the uh, same options that I had there. Now, if forever you set up a scope or you've messed around with your filter settings or anything like that, uh, you can revert everything back to the default by clicking the gear icon and saying restore defaults. So had I been working just to look at uh, only certain extensions and then I need to go back to looking at everything, uh, in this view or in my proxy history, um, I would do something like that. But I am going to indeed check this box and say show only in scope items, which will show me only umbrella. So now we're going to review the proxy tab. The proxy tab is a listed ordered view of all the traffic that's gone through your browser and through Burp. Proxy tab is one of the top level tools, the proxy tool, and then the HTTP history is actually where you're going to see. Uh, all of your traffic. Uh, remember, you can sort this either way. You can also use the other columns to display this data as just posts or just gets uh, or parameterized queries only. Uh, this is really the overall view that you want to use when you want to see a historical complete chain of what requests were in order to institute a certain function in the application. There's also this idea inside of Burp called the right click context menu. And anywhere inside of Burp, just like the filter ribbon exists on many tools, on any single request or sometimes a domain, you can right click on that and you get a lot of options to do certain things inside of Burp. Now you'll see the one of the first ones at the top is add this item to scope. So we can both add individual paths or full domains from any tool inside of Burp to our scope uh, should they be listed. This is most often used when you're viewing your proxy and history tab and you see a domain that you want to add to scope, you can right click on it instantly and say add to scope. This is also used many times when you see a request that you want to tamper with and you want to send it to one of the other tools, such as uh, intruder or repeater or sequencer. Now there's some other stuff inside of the right click context menu uh, that are pro features. The engagement tools section are all pro features for people who buy the pro license of Burp. Um, and then there's also some options to uh, copy the URL or delete the item from your history uh, and go directly to it. Um, you can also institute some of the other tools like Spider or Active Scanner if you have the pro version or Passive Scanner uh, on that individual request should you right click on a request. Let's show a little bit of that right now. All right, so I'm back inside of Burp. And now what I want to do is kind of show off the power of the right click context menu for you guys. Now here I have uh, my target and sitemap tool. And while I'm inside of this, I have some requests. Now I can right click on the top level domain and remove it from scope. I could choose to spider this host with the spider tool. I could scan it for vulnerabilities, which is a pro feature of Burp. I could passively scan this host, which is a pro feature of Burp as well. Uh, there's a ton of engagement tools, which are pro features of Burp, which we might talk about later. Uh, and then I have these options of uh, a pretty useful one, in fact, inside of the site tree uh, is to expand a branch. Now, I'll just show this pretty easy. You can see that you know, sometimes you will have uh, these branches not unfurled. I can, at a high level, say uh, expand a branch and open this up. I right click again here. 
uh, the most useful functions actually are send to the other tools. So remember, burp is a collection of tools uh, inside of one application. Um, I might need to programmatically do something to one of these requests and send it to one of the other tools. So here uh, is the login request that I initially made to Umbrella. And if I wanted to repeat this and not have to use the website a whole bunch, I could send this to the repeater tool, which is our manual tampering tool. And you'll see what happened when I click that, I right clicked and said send to repeater. Repeater lit up orange. And when anything happens inside of Burp, uh, usually when you send a request over or there is an alert of some sort, the tab will temporarily glow orange. Now, if I go into my proxy tab, you can see that I have a whole bunch of uh, requests in chronological order. Uh, the newest being on the top because I'm sorting here uh, of Umbrella Corp. Now I can right, I can click on any of these and see the request and the response in the proxy, but I can also right click here. And I could say remove this from scope and I can do the same things here um, that I did in the other one. I can send to other tools and I have a couple more options to, to do things to individual requests here. You can also use these functions like delete an item. Let's say that I didn't care about a chunk of uh, requests. I can delete them from my HTTP history. That's actually what I did before uh, this lab. I had about 78 requests to be exact um, that weren't part of the, the demo. And so uh, I deleted all of those. And you can see that by the fact that we started at 79, um, our 79th request uh, that Burp had seen. So I deleted those. I can also add comments to some of these. I can copy these URLs. I can copy as a curl command. Some of these are pro pro features, but uh, the right-click context menu is, is useful and apparent in almost every workflow that you use Burp with. What I'm going to do here is go to my filter ribbon or filter bar. I'm going to go ahead and uncheck the box that says show only in scope items just to give you an idea of what we can do here. So you can see that for proxy and my HTTP history viewing tool, now I have no scope applied, so I'm seeing everything that's ever gone through the proxy. If you remember from earlier, we had some requests uh, from Google when we were typing in the URL bar when it was trying to do predictive uh, searches for us. You can click on these and, and see that kind of thing. Um, now what we can do here is, let's say that this was another umbrella site or, an, or a site that was in scope, and I didn't have scope set yet. From here, I can right click and choose add to scope. And this will add Google to my scope rules. So you'll see that target lit up orange. If I go to target, temporarily scope was lit up orange. The first thing you'll see is that Google appears back inside of my site tree. And I can expand this. Actually, I'll just use the right click and say expand branch. And now I have a whole bunch of stuff for Google. Now, I don't know if this is everything because I added only a specific uh, path and request uh, to to scope. And if you look at my scope rules again in the scope tab, you can see that I'm actually scoping google.com port 443 and this file path right here. So this is now added to scope. If I wanted to just add verbatim everything that came from Google and that was in scope for my testing, I can go back to sitemap and at the top level root of google.com, I can right click and choose add to scope and that'll add the top level domain to scope. If we go back in and look at this, you can see that now uh, Google verbatim is uh, as a regex is added uh, for port 443 uh, as a in scope item. So this is the kind of workflow that you'll use between tools, uh, setting scope, removing scope, setting filters, removing filters, etc. And the right click context menu helps instrument all of that. You also notice that there's an options tab under the proxy settings. This allows you to tell Burp what to intercept both requests and responses and also includes useful tools on how to handle uh, certain things when they go outside of the browser. Now, this is one of the most useful functions, which is called match and replace. And match and replace allows you to request certain items in every request that goes out of the proxy and replace it with something else. So this is, uh, there's a whole bunch of default stuff set up in here to change your user agent. So you don't have to do something like that inside of your browser. Uh, and if you have a custom user agent or a custom cookie or token or something like that, you can set that here and set a regex under the match field and add, and then you can go ahead and replace that in every request that goes out uh, from your proxy. This is by far one of the most useful features of automatically editing all the traffic that comes out of Burp Suite. In addition to match and replace, right above it is response modification. 
Response modification allows you to do useful things like unhide hidden form fields and disable JavaScript validation from a lot of places on the website, as well as remove secure cookies and try to make every link go over HTTP. Uh, that is a link that is HTTPS. These can also be useful in certain contexts, and you can play around with these uh, when you're using them. A lot of times what you'll see is a lot of hidden form fields or things like that that you can see by uh, clicking on unhide hidden form fields. Um, and there's a lot of JavaScript re restrictions on things like password fields uh, that won't let you put in certain things, but actually it's just a client-side control uh, forcing you not to do that. It's not a server-side control. So a lot of these can be useful in certain situations. I highly recommend you play around with response modification and match and replace. Now we're going to take a quick look at the Spider tool. Inside of Burp Suite, we have a tool called Spider. And what Spider does is it programmatically will crawl a website for all of the links it sees and sometimes instrument them, and add them to your target tab so that you can basically see all content and functions that a website might have available to you. Now, this idea is great. And as you're viewing it right now, you will, uh, you will learn kind of what it looks like in the tool right now. Burp Suite actually just, uh, or Portswigger just actually released a blog really recently that all of Spider is basically changing to a new technology that they've implemented inside of Burp Suite. And so this might be outdated by the time you see it, but for right now, let's talk a little bit about uh, what's there in the tool for this moment. So your third tab over is your Spider tab, and you have uh, two sub tabs under Spider. Uh, one is Control of the Spider, and one is Options. Now, the first tab allows you to basically pause the spider if you've requested any pages or domains to be spidered, and also clear any queues if something is paused. So this is most often used when you're spidering something and it gets uh, a little bit too hairy and the spider is recursively going forever, and you can pause it and then clear all the queues so that it's uh, there's no more queued up and you can reinstitute either spidering or manually walk the site or, or something like that if spider goes out of control. Um, you can also set a, a scope for the spider, a custom scope. So like I said, everything has the ability to usually set scope or follow scope. By default, the spider will use the scope defined in our targets tab, but you can also set a custom scope for spider, which is pretty useful in certain situations. The other options tab allows you to control how the spider actually works. A spider will check a robots.txt page of a application or a top level domain. Uh, it will try to detect custom not found messages. There's a whole bunch of options inside of here that you can check out. Uh, the ones that you actually want to pay attention to are the maximum link depth and the maximum prior uh, parameterized request per URL. Now, these can kind of control how Burp basically follows and, and how much Burp does when it spiders. Maximum link depth on a application by default is five and can be tweaked a little bit if you want a more thorough crawl. You can set it to anything from six, seven, or eight usually the max I go up to, but usually that can get out of control. Most of the time I find myself reducing maximum length and depth to maybe three on a very complex application. Um, maximum prioritized request per URL is usually a default set of 50. Uh, I can tune this down usually to 25 in a normal application. There's also the control for passive spidering. When you start up Burp, by default, uh, passive spider is enabled. That means that when you use your browser actually and go through a page, uh, it will spider that page as you visit it in your browser. Uh, and there's a difference between spidering automatically or right-clicking inside of Burp and asking something to be spidered. Now, in some instances, you may love the idea that when you visit a page through your browser and it's going through Burp, it'll automatically spider that page. But in other instances, when you actually don't want to spider the page or a page is very dynamic and the spider is not working well, uh, you might not want to do that. So you have the option to uncheck passive spider in here. I usually start with passive spidering turned off. Uh, and then later on, if I need or if I feel like it's going to help me, I can uh, check that box again and institute passive spidering. Let's show how that works now. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, show a little bit of spider usage uh, throughout Burp. Now, uh, the first thing I'm going to do is go into my scope and ensure that I took Google out of my scope because I don't want the spider to uh, basically traverse Google links. So I did indeed do that uh, before the demo, so uh, that's gone. Those Google entries are gone. And check on my spider here. Um, it's paused right now. This button indicates whether it's running or not. It works very similarly to the um, the intercept button. I push it on and off. And then once it's paused, you can clear its queue so that it doesn't work anymore. 
Uh, it's using the default scope, so that's good. Now let me go to my target tab and my site map, and here is Umbrella Corp internal. What I'm going to do is I'm going to spider Umbrella Corp internal. So go ahead and choose spider this host. So spider uh, close up orange. I can look at this and I can see that it's it's done. Now we really only have one page on the outside of of spider and so spider is set to automatically see some forms and try to fill them in here you can see it tried to uh, log in with a uh, pass of this and then a username of this um, there are some defaults for how spider fills in form fields and if it executes forms at all uh, sometimes this can be dangerous if you have spider uh, execute form fields and then it will trigger a, a page that triggers an email and then you can get uh, kind of in hairy situations there so uh, you can configure that uh, in some other places it makes the tool. Now, uh, let me go ahead and log into this application. Use the trusty old admin admin password. All right. So now um, you can see that uh, the application and inside of the site tree has kind of blown up a little bit. Now, now that I have access to the full internal site, I can actually use Spider to institute and visit each one of these links and find more, uh, find more sites maybe. So I'm gonna go ahead and right click up here and choose Spider this host again. Let's see what happens. If I go to Spider, I can see that there's a uh, queues and it's running. Uh, and actually what happened was when I visited this page, I didn't actually go to these. Um, what happened was that uh, Spider actually ran automatically uh, because inside of Spider, just like I was talking about in the slides, uh, if you go to control or uh, options, um, passively spider as you browse was already checked. Uh, so as soon as I visited this page manually, the spider went, uh, right clicking on it actually didn't do anything because it already had went. And, uh, and now paths are enumerated inside of uh, this place. So uh, some things here, uh, when you're looking inside of like a website like this, uh, you can click through uh, and, uh, and you'll start to see that when you visit things, basically things start blowing up in your site tree. Now, if you run into an application that is super dynamic, uh, what will happen a lot of times is you'll hit maybe one path or one function or something that can be instituted several different ways and turn slightly different content. And what will happen there is your, your site tree will blow up. So uh, what you wanna do is, is you wanna control your spider or something like that happens. Remember, you can just uncheck this box and, and it'll pause again. You can clear queues for next time. So the spider is pretty straightforward. You can institute the spider from the site tree by right-clicking and choosing spider this host. You can also do it in proxy. If you see a host here, you can right-click and say spider from here. Um, it'll just spider from that specific path. So if I just wanted to spider this somewhat unique path here, uh, number home, you could right-click here and say spider from here. And the spider will start at this path and, and crawl everything inside of there. Now we're gonna go over a brief introduction to Burp Intruder. Burp Intruder is easily one of the most valuable tools inside of the Burp suite. Burp Intruder allows you to take a request and instrument it like you were doing a programmatic attack. What this means is back in the day when we used to need to instrument uh, web app attacks by iterating over lots of numbers or uh, we needed to exploit a system uh, in, uh, with a lot of requests, we used to have to uh, use a scripting language like Python or something like that, or Bash. Uh, Intruder helps us not only instrument the mass amount of requests with custom payload lists and things like that, but it also allows us to, when we're doing those types of attacks, uh, normally called buzzing, uh, you can filter the output in a customized way that would be very difficult to do if you were doing it through scripting. This tool is very much modeled after the workflow of someone who's doing manual testing on a website. In a nutshell, if you go to your intruder tab, you then have several subtabs. Each one of these represents one intruder attack. Inside number one here, we have a target tab, a positions tab, a payload tab, and an options tab. Now, one of the most important tabs is your positions tab. I have sent a request to intruder, and now I have to tell intruder what I'm gonna do or what I want to do with that request. Now inside of Intruder, you can wrap any specific part of the request in what are called payload markers. The payload markers are those uh, double squiggly S's around the parameter value of password. 
Now this is hard to explain via slides, so we're gonna go straight into a demo. So now we're gonna demo using Burp Intruder to brute force a password field. This is just one of the use cases that you can use Burp for. You can use Burp for fuzzing or, or a lot of different things, but uh, this is one way to easily illustrate what we're gonna do here. Now here on the left-hand side, you have Umbrella Internals login page. We've guessed the password for this in the past, but that's okay. We're going to actually uh, use it um, again so we can illustrate the function of Intruder. So right now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to proxy and I'm gonna turn intercept on so no traffic can go through. What I'm gonna do here is just send some trash for username and password. I'm gonna say submit. Now I know that when I click submit and when I'm trying to log into the application, it's a post request with a username of uh, something and a password of something. Now what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna right click and say send this to Intruder. Now Intruder uh, has preloaded a new tab called seven uh, and this is my most newest intruder attack uh, with a target, a, pay, a positions, a payloads, and an options tab. Now, the first tab that comes up is uh, your target. And you just want to verify this is the correct domain and the correct port and you know, protocol that you want to use. Then most of the configuration will be done inside of positions and payloads. So let's head over to the positions tab. So here we have that HTTP request. Burp automatically has identify that there are some parameter values and that's maybe where we want to fuzz this request or brute force and uh, indeed it is correct but i want to show you how to do that manually uh, so if you send a request to repeater and it marks a whole bunch of stuff and you only want to fuzz a certain number of parameter values or a certain header or something like that uh, you'll go over here and choose clear and you'll want to set your own up uh, pretty easy you just highlight the section where we're going to brute force the first section we're going to brute force is uh, the user so we're going to add payload markers around the value of the parameter user and then we're going to add payload markers to the uh, value of password so you can see they're wrapped by these squiggly lines which we call payload markers uh, now we have to choose an attack type and uh, we'll explain how these attack type work uh, in depth uh, sometime later uh, but right now we're just going to use uh, cluster bomb now we're going to go into the payloads section and because i set two payloads in the positions tab one and two you'll see that i have two payloads set the first that i'm on right now and then the second is right there so i'm going to choose one and what this does is basically burp allows uh, intruder allows you to uh, take the value that i marked and do something and add something to that in a programmatic way now what we want to do here is brute force the username and password of this site and so for that we're going to use simple list but there are several other options of what type of payload that might be. Uh, most commonly people use uh, numbers, so you can iterate through a large number uh, set in the value of a parameter. Uh, you can set specific dates. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, fancy payload types here you could use. But right now we're just gonna use the easiest one, which is simple list. Now, because uh, I have the pro version, I'm presented with some default list that Burp can give me right off the bat down here. It says add from list. Uh, so we're in the simple list area. And then if I go add from list, Burp includes a whole bunch of buzzing lists and username lists and everything else. And so it has a long list of what looks like 8,894 common usernames that I could try to brute force uh, this post request with. Now that's too many for example, the demos. So I'm gonna click clear and remove those from my payloads list. Now I'm gonna add some of my own to make a custom list. Here, I'm just gonna iterate through some off the top of my head usernames uh, that could let us log into the application. So I'll go ahead and say root, and we'll add that. And we'll say admin history core, and we'll add that. And we'll say user, default. We'll add Bob, add Alice, E, Wagnito, admin, and we'll add blank. All right, so we have 10 usernames that we've entered in to try to brute force uh, the username part. Now we'll set 
our second payload marker, you'll see we have one and two, so pass is the second one. Um, our second payload marker set here uh, with passwords. Now again, Burp has a built-in passwords list, which is probably pretty long, eight, probably about 8,000 lines or something like that of passwords. But we're just gonna enter in some of our own just off the top of our heads, let's say change me. We'll add that, we'll say minister admin administrator one two three four five six password blank John. we've got about eight passwords here that we're going to try now, with Intruder, there are uh, other options that you can set. Um, here you can set how fast the attack runs by the number of threads that it uses, what it does on retries, and then we can also do some um, matching and grepping of the output of the attacks themselves to help us uh, make sense of the output when it's a large attack or a large fuzzing attack. Um, but we're right now just going to institute this attack. So we go back to payloads, um, and we can just choose the Start Attack button. Uh, now, uh, what this is going to do is open up a new window. And uh, a word of warning here is that this is going to run much faster than the free version. Right now, I'm working in the pro version of Burp. Uh, the free version has throttling built into it so that uh, this attack or the, the intruder tool uh, runs more slow uh, than a pro version. And sometimes these fuzzing attacks, if they're uh, very long and you're using long lists of, of fuzzing payloads, uh, can take uh, quite a while to run. Uh, Burp Intruder, though, in the Pro version is not throttled. Uh, you can set it as fast as you want and, and do these attacks pretty easily. You can go ahead and say Start Attack. Now you can see a total of uh, 80 requests went through, and so uh, every username was tested with every password. And uh, and when you're looking at the output of of an intruder attack, uh, you want to look at each column and then think about uh, what they what they represent normally. So uh, I know that uh, roots and change me is definitely not um, you know the username and password for this application. So uh, I want to look at uh, a common not working request in this instance uh, and look at the request. That's fine. That's everything. And look at the response. So uh, the response included uh, a text that said access denied. So I know I didn't log in correctly here. Uh, but the status code was a 200, so I, uh, I know that. And then the content length was 515. Uh, now, so for everything that didn't work, it looks very similar uh, that uh, there was a content length of 515. So if I go through here, um, and if I've triggered a correct password, uh, I might see either a different status code or a different content length. And indeed, for admin admin, you can see that I received both, uh, both a different status code and a uh, different content length. Now, uh, an easier way to do this would just be to click the column up here in the arrow and show me uh, everything. It'll group the status codes together. So 302 is the only one and got, it gets filtered to the top here. So I know that's a success. Um, and also you can do the same thing with length. So you can filter by uh, everything was 515 that didn't work. And if I filter it this way, 489, which is a smaller, content like come back. Um, and then you can do uh, fancier things with the output. So um, basically, if I know that uh, that a login has a certain word once you get that 302 redirect, um, or if I know the uh, the bad error uh, that you get back when you try to log that login, uh, I can see access to nine is here. So I can copy this. And now I can go into options. And this is um, a little bit intermediary at burp skills, but uh, you can go here and there's a section in your options for your intruder attack to match a uh, string basically. So I can say clear all these, uh, the ones that uh, burp uh, included. I want to clear all those from my grep. And it's easier just to show what this does and explain. Basically, it creates a new column for you inside of your intruder attack. I can paste in access denied and add. And that'll do if I go back to my results. As you can see, uh, everything that had the string access denied in it um, is checked over here. And so I can also uh, see that this one did not have access denied. So I'd want to investigate that. There's also functions to extract parts of web pages using 
grep extract. Um, you can do a lot of uh, fancy things with the output of an intruder attack. But, uh, but this one in particular was successful. I know that uh, admin admin uh, returned something different and I would like to go try that in the application. And indeed earlier, uh, we realized that admin admin was the password that let us into the, the app. So that's just a sample of the kind of things that Burp Intruder uh, can do. Now we're gonna take a quick look at the repeater tool. The repeater tool inside of Burp allows us to powerfully replay individual requests and tamper with them. It's often what I spend the most of my time in inside of Burp is repeater, intruder, and the target in the proxy history tabs. This allows me to send over individual requests that I think might be vulnerable to some type of manipulation, send them to repeater, and then go ahead and start tampering with them. The first thing you want to do when you get into a repeater session is you'll notice that are, they're numbered tabs just like intruder, and you consider each one as a repeater attack and they each get their own number. And when you send it to here, you can go into your tab for that attack, you can see your request, here you can see a login request for the Umbrella Corp internal site, and then you can start tampering with it however you please, changing uh, everything that you need to. Uh, but the first thing you want to do when you jump in here is click go so you can get a baseline request and you can use the back and forward buttons. The back and forward buttons uh, allow you to uh, just back up to a previous attack or go forward to something you've done in the past. Uh, it's just like your browser button where you can go back to different pages. So you want to have that baseline to start with where you had the request verbatim and the response verbatim for the first request. We're going to show a little bit of repeater now. All right, so now we're going to switch it up a little bit. So on the left-hand side of the screen, I have a pretty popular XSS game for learners who are just getting into cross-site scripting. And it's called xss-game.appspot.com. This is available on the internet. You can go try it yourself. There's multiple levels to um, kind of institute your skills. But it's a good way to illustrate a common workflow for testing for cross-site scripting using Burp Repeater. Uh, now you can also see that I've changed to Firefox. And the reason I've changed to Firefox is to uh, make sure that I don't have a cross-site scripting based filter in the browser blocking my cross-site scripting alerts. And uh, Chrome has this, it can be turned off, but for ease of use, I've switched over to Firefox to do my XSS testing. On this page, uh, there's a mission description, uh, but there's a iframed window here of a search bar. And a search bar is usually a pretty good target for something like cross-site scripting. Um, and so I can go in here and search for any content I want. And that should, uh, that should let me kind of illustrate using repeater. I've also set up Firefox using Foxy Proxy to route through Burp. So you can see here that uh, B is chosen, my profile B, which is, uh, which is for Burp. So here I have some, I have some just a general description. Um, if I refresh this page and I go to my proxy and history tab, this is where I should start seeing traffic for xss-game.appspot.com come through. Uh, because I've set a scope earlier in the video of that I only want to see umbrella uh, sites or Umbrella Corp internal, um, what happened is, is it popped up a pop-up box that said, do you want to stop logging out of scope, pro uh, out of scope traffic in the proxy uh, tool? And I said, yes. So that means that no traffic from any out of scope site uh, is being logged inside of, inside of this tool. So luckily Burp gives us a banner here, a very useful banner that says re-enable uh, logging all of out of scope tra traffic. So I'm going to say re-enable. And then I'll re-refresh again. Now you can see XSS game appspot.com show up uh, inside of my inside of my page or inside of my HTTP history. Now I can see these requests here. I'm just going to go ahead and enter in some garbage here. Say search. And you see here's my search query that came across, and I click it. Under it, it has my request and my response. Now when looking at uh, anything that reflects content. Um, you know, you're going to want to test for cross-site scripting based vulnerabilities. Um, here I've sent across a random string of characters, and in the response, the random string of characters would echo, was echoed here. Um, and this might be something that I automatically trigger in my brain. Okay, well, I need to test this for cross-site scripting. So I'm going to go ahead and right-click here and choose Send to Repeater. Now, Repeater, like Intruder, uh, is separated into attacks. And so we have attack tabs here. I've had uh, six attacks for this session, um, and I am selected on six right now, which is this XSS game page. And you can see uh, here is the query, and then uh, here is the rest of the request. Now, the first thing you want to do when you get into Repeater is set up baseline requests so you can always go back to it. 
when you are uh, doing your tampering. So I'm going to say go here. And here is, this will be my baseline request. You can see that uh, AEF, AEF uh, didn't, uh, didn't return any results and my output was uh, rendered in the page. So now using repeater, it's kind of your scalpel-like manual testing tool. And so you can do things and just modify these requests on the fly. So I can add um, less than or greater than signs, which are uh, HTML tags or script tags, uh, you know, to use to institute uh, those types of tags. Uh, I can add a single double quote. Um, and these are the type of characters I need to build a cross-site scripting-based attack to not be encoded uh, in the result of the page. And so if I say go, I can see that indeed these characters are verbatim uh, echoed inside of the page. Um, now I might want to test a whole bunch of areas of this if other things are reflecting in the response of the page, um, but this is a pretty indicative uh, lab, and I know that uh, I know that these characters are not encoded um, on the way back. So. A lot of times what you'll do when you're inside of this workflow inside of repeater is you want to put a pretty unique string when you're doing this input testing. And so um, I can do something like uh, here next to the characters, I want to see just swag me go. Um, and then click go and you'll see here. And a lot of times in the right hand side in the response view, uh, this is not going to be as small as it is for this lab. A lot of times pages include, you know, long, long character or long, long amounts of characters and just like a long, long uh, source page of JavaScript. And, you know, the more dynamic a page is, the larger it's going to be and the harder it's going to be just to like scroll through here and see uh, where your input is is coming back. And so that's what you use this unique text for is uh, you can put Swagneto there and then in the search box on the bottom under response, you can just put uh, Swagneto and then everywhere it sees uh, everywhere that your inputted text uh, lands, uh, you'll see that uh, it will be uh, here. And you can use the forward and back arrows. If this was larger, it would automatically go to the next place where Swagnito was inside of the returned content for that page. Um, now I have a, you know, I see Swagnito and then I see my characters echoed verbatim after this. So now I'm going to go ahead and just try to institute a very generic cross site scripting based attack. So I will actually put my full payload in here which will be script alert spikenito script. And then that went through over the wire. And then you can see in the results that, uh, that it should actually render as a, an alert. And this should execute as cross-site scripting. Uh, there's no encoding of, of any of these characters. There's no XSS protection set by the headers. Um, so we should most of the time be good with this attack and this should work. Uh, so you can see now that I have, uh, I've had this attack and I've had a couple inside uh, of number six and I can go back to the last one, which was just identifying meta, meta characters. And I can go back again to my first one and I can go forward as well. So this, uh, this allows me to uh, kind of try something and go back just like a browser would. Um, now uh, you can also uh, render the page that you're looking to for in the response. This is available in a lot of the parts of the tool. Uh, or a lot of the parts of BERT, but uh, you can view just the headers separated from the HTML. You can view a hex representation of, uh, of all of the stuff on your page or, or your page content. You can look at an, just the HTML for the page and see uh, if anything, uh, it, or just the HTML on the page to see how it rendered. Um, and then you could actually render the page. This is a, a limited, uh, a limited rendering of, uh, of the page. It doesn't, uh, execute all JavaScript, it doesn't load all images. So, all right, so I'm gonna go back to raw and uh, I'm pretty sure that this attack will work live. Uh, so I can do a couple things here. I can go back to my game and just execute the attack here. If I paste in uh, script alert, so I can get a script and search. You can see that it gives me when it says, congratulations, you have executed, executed alert, so I can, you know, and you can now advance to the next level. So uh, the XSS attack was indeed successful. Um, and so I know that that works. Uh, you can also do uh, some other stuff here. So because we're inside a repeater and we have access to the right click context menu and this is filled out, uh, I can right click here and say, uh, show request in browser. Um, and so this will tell my browser to send this request verbatim. So I don't have to paste in the cross site scripting string um, in the other window. I can just choose uh, request in browser you have in your original session or your current session. I'm gonna choose in my current browser session, and this will give me a burp link, and I can choose to copy this and then paste it 
in my browser. And this will have burp repeat the request in my browser. Uh, and then you can see that absolutely uh, I triggered the alert again and I, I won the level. Um, so this is useful in doing all kinds of things. Um, right click and uh, request in browser is, uh, is definitely a helper that you'll use a lot inside of Repeater. Um, and uh, and there's some other ones as well that we might talk about later on in the course. Uh, also, so the search bar you know has some options too under the plus bar. You can search for things that are only case sensitive or only match your regex. Um, and you can auto scroll to match uh, when text changes, which is one of the options uh, we'll talk about in the cross-site scripting based module um, and in one of the other tools, Intruder, which is very useful. So that's a gentle introduction to uh, Repeater. And uh, now we'll move on. So now we're gonna move on to the decoder tool. The decoder tool inside of Burp is a small tool designed to help you decode data you might find obfuscated inside of application traffic. Many times you'll see something like base64 or ASCII hex or something that's URL encoded that you need to quickly highlight and decode on the fly and then maybe re-encode again once you change it. So here you can see in the top box of decoder, we have a string that we found in an application. We've used the right-click context menu to send it over to decoder. And then we've dropped down a menu on the right-hand side to decode it as one of the options. And then it creates a new menu under that of the decoded data or the try to be decoded data. Now we can uh, we can do this several times and decode again or re-encode again from the second tab because it has its own drop-down menu. And so we're going to give you a quick overview of using this uh, this tool inside of Burp. It's a very helpful tool to be able to send things to this menu and be able to decode them on the fly. All right. So now you can see that uh, we've reopened Umbrella Corp internal on the left-hand side. Uh, we've logged in and we, we have the site tree built out a little bit for uh, this site. And there is some dynamic content and there's some things I want to look at. Uh, but one of the things we always want to look for inside of an application is its robots.txt file. Now the robots.txt file is basically a, a rule set or a text file that's set on the root of your server that tells web crawlers like Yahoo and Google um, to not index these sites for their search engines. And uh, this is a standard on the internet, and, and you should have uh, learned a little bit about this in the prerequisite. Uh, but what you see here is a is an in dot, uh, is a robot.txt file. The reason we check this file uh, pretty often is it's pretty indicative of places that developers or application owners do not want us to go, which means as a hacker we're interested in going to those places. Uh, now you can see at the end of this robots.txt page there is a string here, and uh, and just by eyeballing uh, I know that because of the padding characters the equal equal. Um, this actually uh, might be a string that is useful um, to decode. And so we're going to illustrate decoder. Um, I'm going to go ahead and right click here, just straight out of the browser and copy. Now I can go to the decoder tab, and this is a helper tool to do this. You can also take any input inside any of these pages and just right click and say send it to decoder. So uh, if I wanted to try to decode you know, this, uh, this path name here, I could select this and then right click and send it to decoder. And you'll see that ends up here. But for this demo, actually, we're gonna try to uh, paste in this value. And uh, and we think it's a base64 uh, string because of the padding at the end of the, uh, the base64 uh, encoding. So here you have on the right-hand side, you have decode as, encode as, and hash, and then a smart decode button. Um, what normally your workflow is gonna look like is you're gonna send something here, or you're gonna paste something here, and just click the drop-down menu, decode as, and choose what you want to decode this is. I'm going to say base64. Uh, and then that decoded the string. Uh, and indeed, it turns out to be uh, one of the very simple CTF flags robots.fun. Um, and so here you could also, if you were parameter manipulating something, let's say the value of a parameter was base64 encoded or uh, hashed or something like that, um, you could also change this and let's say uh, robots.nofun. And because I have this second box here, now I can uh, instrument rules on just this box. And now I can say encode it again as base64. And so here is my uh, base64 string. Um, and then I could send this back into a request, maybe inside of repeater. Or, uh, it just a, allows me on the fly um, to check out strings and, and things that I think might be interesting to decode. So you have a lot of options here. Um, you have uh, URL decoding, HTML, base64, ASCII, hex, et cetera, et cetera. And you can also, um, encode as all of those same formats. And then you can also hash things uh, as you go, go along. 
Uh, there is a smart decode button. So if I uh, go ahead and say smart decode, um, it'll try to run some magic here. Here, it, it didn't really work. Um, you also have the option to, when you decode as something, uh, you also have the option to view it in text, which we're viewing right now, or hex mode. So you can see this is the hex for, uh, for that string. So decoder is a, a relatively simple tool that allows you to just inspect uh, you know, a whole bunch of different type of formats so that maybe you can deobfuscate some data that you found inside of sites. So next up is the scanner tool which is a pro-only tool inside of Burp Suite. So the scanner tool is basically an automated scanner that will automatically try to find security vulnerabilities inside a given domain. Inside of Burp, it's prominent when you have the pro version. Uh, it's right inside of your sitemap, um, and it also has its own tab dedicated to its output. You can see you can select the domain here and right-click on any domain and choose actively scan this host or passively scan this host which will send those to the scanner, and they will go ahead and go to every link that's inside of your site tree and all of the traffic that's linked to it and scan it for common security vulnerabilities. When you're inside of the scanner tab, you'll see that you have an issue activity, your scan queue, uh, some live scanning options, and some general options for, for the tool. Now, inside of your scanner and issue activity is where you're going to see any output uh, from these types of automated checks. And so, here you can see that the scanner actually identified an issue of which it thinks is high severity, um, and that is a clear text submission of a password. And so uh, indeed, when we were using Umbrella Corporation, uh, we did log in over HTTP, credentials went across the wire where anybody can uh, look at them in transit uh, if they're in the middle, or uh, caching servers cache them or something like that. So our credentials are now uh, known to entities that are not our, ourselves. And so uh, it recognized this and it sent an alert. Now, Burp Scanner has plenty of uh, intricacies and uh, scan checks for it. And that's actually one of the better scanners in the industry right now. Uh, for the amount of money that Burp costs to buy, the scanner um, is very, very powerful uh, and continues to make great strides and get better and better. There's not a lot of many dynamic tools that can rival it. So how does the scanner work? Basically, the scanner takes all of the requests that you manually browse for or anything that it found via Spider and finds all the input points for the request. Now, this can be a lot of things, and you can set up in the options about which input points the scanner will fuzz, uh, automatically test for common security vulnerabilities. But these can be things like parameter names, parameter values, and get or post, headers, rest path, et cetera. All of these are common input points uh, for any type of dynamic scanner. So here you can see that uh, Burp Spider and browsing to find all of the input points um, here you can see a common request. And so on the right-hand side, uh, I've actually removed all the request values and just shown you uh, how the spider looks at everything in a request like this. So um, you could inject content or fuzz um, after the uh, slash in the post request in the request field up top. Uh, you can do it to the host header. You can inject data into any one of the header fields, as well as the name of the parameters. You can add custom headers and the values of the parameters. So basically, anywhere uh, in the request, the scanner tool can instrument attacks. And this is uh, why scanner attacks can sometimes do hundreds of thousands of requests um, to try to find vulnerabilities inside of websites. So here you can see Burp Spider. I'm going to make it a little bit bigger for everyone to see. I'm going to show you that in the pro version, you actually get the sidebar here, um, which has the issues pane and, uh, and its details set up below. And so if I click the top level of Umbrella, uh, you can see that it's already identified an issue through the passive scanner uh, when I logged in over HTTP. And so here you can see that I can click on this issue, and this will show all issues for Umbrella Corp Eternal. Uh, and the advisory here goes into great detail about uh, what this vulnerability is, um, its background, its issue and remediation information. And then I can go to the request and response set in specific um, you know, made this a bad thing. So uh, we have this, um, and Scanner remembers a pro-only feature, and then we also have the Scan tab. So instead of looking at, uh, at issues per domain, which you can do here if you have multiple domains in scope and you're scanning multiple domains uh, and finding vulnerabilities on them and then clicking on them, you can also look per path. It will show issues on the specific path, et cetera. Um, you can go to the Scanner tab itself. Now in the scanner tab, you have your issue activity, 
you have your scan queue, your live scanning options, um, your issue definitions, which will help you learn about the different issues it checks for, uh, and then you have the scanner options. Um, so here we see that uh, that it has a numbered request field. This is this works very much like uh, your fighter history, uh, or your sorry, your proxy history tool. Um, it just shows in an ordered fashion what it found that it thinks is an issue. And every issue has a color-coded scheme uh, and an icon to it. Informational-based findings uh, have an eye, uh, alerts have a question mark, um, and then low severity items are yellow, medium severity items are orange, and then high severity items or critical severity items are red. Um, now you can see that the first issue it found was unencrypted communications with uh, Umbrella Corp, which is true. Um, this is not good. All sites should travel over HTTPS. Um, and so it gives you an issue here and an advisory. And that's just kind of an overview of everything the scanner has found. Now you can go to your scan queue. While I'm running a live scan for any given site, um, this will show what it's working on. So if I go to the target tab and right click on Umbrella Corp internal, I can say actively scan this host. And we get some options here. Uh, we can remove duplicate items um, that maybe are the same URL and parameter. We can remove items with no parameters. Uh, we can remove fuzzing or scanning media responses, things that give us back, uh, you know, images. And then we can remove uh, items with fuzzing the following extensions, which are JavaScript and, and image and CSS. So when you're quickly instrumenting the scanner, uh, when you're doing this type of work, uh, usually I remove duplicate items unless I think that that's useful for the specific application. Um, also, if I need to do a quick scan of, of something, I remove items with no parameters unless I know the site is using a, a REST-based um, URL structure, um, because uh, I only want to deal with dynamic data, um, and then I want to remove, I always keep uh, remove items with media responses and remove items with the following extensions checked. So this gives us uh, basically six items that Burp has ever seen in its history that it thinks it wants to uh, inject some content into, and then you can say okay. So now you can see that scanner lit up, and it's got six items uh, where it is uh, going ahead and uh, sending a whole bunch of attacks uh, to uh, these six items and uh, it's running and you can see the stage completed and one has an issue and uh, these will continue to populate both in the target tab in the context when you menu and then also in the scanner issue activity menu Go back to the issue activity menu and sort this for the newest things at the top you can see hey it found the robots.txt file um, which is an informational finding and you can see that our base64 string was here uh, it might find some other stuff with this site so also you have the option to configure some of the live scanning uh, checks here or configuration options. So you can say that automatically when you browse, um, I want to scan everything that I see when I browse. This is not recommended. Uh, usually you want to keep this off so that uh, when you're browsing, you're not just automatically throwing SQL injection strings or cross-site scripting strings into everything. That is uh, fun and a great idea, but not great in practice. And you could uh, end up on a part of an application you really mess up because you have this running. So definitely um, be very cognizant of what you're scanning. Um, passive scanning is the same idea. Passively, passively scanning means it's analyzing um, traffics but not sending uh, any requests to the server. Looking at JavaScript files, um, you know, anything that it can do without actually sending a request to the server, it'll alert you on vulnerabilities for. Now, this actually can be useful every once in a while, but I turn it off by default. I don't want scanner really doing anything unless I tell it to. I want to right click on a domain and actually cognizantly uh, choose to start scanning something if I ever want to do that. So I set that to don't scan. Under issue definitions, you have the definitions, the type index, and the severity of all the issues that um, Burp scanner is able to find, which is numerous, right? We have things uh, that are a very high severity here, OS command injection, SQL injection, XML en external entity injection. Um, and like I said, Burp is one of the better scanners out there. It has a, a good amount of detail for each check, and, um, and it's very configurable. It's kind of the uh, manual testers uh, tool set to, to basically um, get coverage for a large site when you're, when you're doing a security testing. A lot of people like to say, you know, you do manual testing, and you do do manual testing for a lot of this. You're inside of repeater, and when you're doing application testing, you're uh, sending things over and manually fuzzing certain things and maybe using intruder to do um, some automated checks. But really, uh, really, if you have a large dynamic site, um, part of your methodology has to be eventually as an application assessor to scan it um, because there's no way that you as a human could have ever seen every nook and cranny and every parameter um, that was on that site and done that yourself for looking for all of these different vulnerability classes. Uh, most of the in-depth 
high critical vulnerabilities that you'll find will be through manual, manual testing, but you can find some low hanging fruit um, and even sometimes some decent things, uh, really good stuff with uh, the automated scanner. So with the automated scanner, uh, you also have those input point options, right? Where do you want the scanner to attack and put those attack strings in and um, try to tell you if there's an issue? And so you can see here, the default ones are URL parameter values, which is very correct. We should be doing that body parameter values and post requests, cookie parameter value or cookie parameter values, cookie uh, parameter names, uh, any HTTP header, uh, and the path file name and path folders. Uh, you could also set up, you know, a whole bunch of options in here on how you do um, some stuff here. Uh, one of the things that's uh, filled in by default is skip injection tests um, if they match these expressions here, which is your a lot of default cookie values for different frameworks. So this is this is really good. If you have a framework um, that uses a default cookie value um, and you want to exclude it from being fuzzed um, so that the scanner doesn't uh, mess up your session, you can add it here to the scanner options. Um, the active scanning engine area of the scanner or the scanner options is uh, is the area where you control how fast the scanner works you can change its request a uh, concurrent request limit to you know 5 10 whatever um, if you're you know if you have a, a pretty good link to the internet and you have pretty good bandwidth you can up this a little bit uh, but just be cognizant of what you keep this um, this scanning engine kind of at because it will uh, it will definitely uh, send attacks to the server in a rapid amount of time a rapid sense and uh, you could DOS the server or trigger something. And so just be very cognizant of how you use this tool. Now, uh, you definitely want to um, look at your active scanning optimization here. So scanning speed, I normally keep it normal, um, but scan accuracy, I want to minimize false positives. And then actually uh, in scan speed, I choose thorough most of the time. Um, so uh, I want the scanner to, uh, to basically keep its maximum depth, um, checking every parameter, um, and so uh, these options help uh, help make the scanner a little bit a little bit more thorough and um, and concrete in its output. Uh, scan issues is really where uh, I spend a lot of my time too. So uh, I don't want to fuzz for many of these common informational vulnerabilities. I, I kind of know they either already exist or they're not important to me. Sorry, as a bounty hunter, so I can uh, sort these by severity here, um, or I can sort them by scan type. And so here inside of uh, informational, um, a lot of these are uh, somewhat important, uh, but some of them I don't really care about. So uh, let's say that you know for the purposes of this video, I don't actually want to know about anything informational. So I'm gonna click this here, uh, select individual issues, and I'm gonna take all of the informational issues. Scrolling is hard. I'm gonna choose the top one and then scroll all the way down, hold shift. And then that will highlight all of the informational ones. And I can right click here and choose enabled and click that and it will disable all those informational categories. Um, now it depends on what you're doing and you might want some of these, right? Like there, there is a check for checking for the robot.tech file. I want that on. Um, I enjoy alerting. I enjoy the scanner alerting me whenever there's base64 encoded data in the uh, parameter. Um, I enjoy the scanner telling me when it sees directory listing. Um, link manipulation, DOM, HTML file storage, uh, you know, file upload functionality is another good one too. If for uh, scanner identifies a file upload, I want it to tell me if it's some in some obscure place that I haven't used in the application yet. I definitely want to put that on my list of things to test. So there are some like low-level informational stuff that's really valuable. Um, so I can check those back, and then you can edit your scan policy. And then when the scanner goes out and does its thing, it only checks for those classes of vulnerabilities. Uh, normally when I'm in here, um, I am excluding a lot of the DOM-based stuff um, just because it, it doesn't really pan out and you know, creates a pretty verbose activity stream for the scanner. Um, so I, uh, I disable a lot of the DOM-based stuff. Um, I'm looking for verbatim injections, pretty simple injections, low-hanging fruit kind of stuff uh, when I'm choosing to run a scanner like this and not do manual testing. Um, otherwise, you, you might be creating too many requests or, or something like that. And that could be not good. Uh, so then it has a section called static analysis and static analysis allows you to uh, basically look at the javascript and the the page to do some kind of analysis on uh, javascript it depends on what your scope is but uh, you might or might not want this running in the background uh, sometimes i choose to not perform static analysis um, on the files themselves so uh, i will enable don't perform static analysis here 
And that's an overview of the Burp Scanner. So we've talked a little bit about each high-level tool or most of the high-level tools inside of Burp Suite. Uh, now I want to talk a little bit about you know, what can you do with Burp? What do you do inside of an application testing uh, mindset with Burp Suite? Uh, and maybe some more examples of the more powerful things that you can do in Burp Suite. So what can Burp help you with? So inside of the target, you can focus on specific sites by clicking on their domains and see all of the traffic inside of the context when you in that view. And that helps you drill down on specific domains and see what you, you sent there and, and the traffic that's gone through there. You can also look inside of any specific tree and click on a function or a path or a page and look at all the requests that you've sent there. Uh, this helps you uh, drill down on certain parts of the application. And in general, the target tab helps you visualize through its tree style view, all of the attack surface and with its icons, what's dynamic and what you should be looking to test on an application. And then also it allows you to set a scope to filter all the other tools so that you may only see what you want to see in a certain given engagement. The proxy tool helps you trap and modify live traffic with the intercept button. So you can always stop what's going through uh, the proxy and, and trap it and intercept it, change it, modify it, and let it on its way. It also allows you to view historical data on all of the traffic that's gone through, or maybe just the stuff that's in scope um, that's gone through in its history tab. And you can set wide scale configurations for traffic uh, anything that goes through through Burp. When we saw in the options menu, you can add headers, remove headers, edit things, uh, so that every time something goes through, uh, you can change it on the fly. The repeater function allows you to request things quickly uh, from any tool inside of Burp. So if you see one request that you want to tamper with, you can right click on it and choose uh, send a repeater, and then you can replay that request and tamper with it. It's where you'll spend a good amount of your time inside of Burp. It allows you to perform what's called manual testing. Intruder allows you to set up robust automated and scripted attacks. Uh, you can fuzz parameters and paths. You can brute force passwords. You can do content discovery. You can iterate IDs uh, for vulnerabilities like insecure direct object references or things like that. There's a lot of stuff that Intruder can help you with inside of your project. And then your scanner will automatically uh, do this type of fuzzing, uh, dynamic scanning across a whole site um, automatically for you if you have the pro version of Burp. So another related and helpful tool that I use in Burp Suite all the time is this tool called Seclist. So really it's a project called Seclist, uh, and it is a collection of text files which uh, have all kinds of fuzzing strings inside of them. And it's meant to be instrumented through Burp Intruder, uh, and it allows you to fuzz, uh, manually fuzz, uh, any, anything using Burp Intruder. Now this is very similar to a dynamic scanner tool, uh, where they are sending strings. You can see on the right-hand side, you can see the value of one of these files. It's just a whole bunch of SQL injection attacks, very generic SQL injection attacks. Um, and the workflow of a dynamic scanner is, is have a list like this of known test cases, send them along to everywhere in an application or one specific place in an application, and then see if an error message comes back that would indicate uh, that there is a, an actual injection here. And so. Uh, this FuzzDB, or the Seclist project, and another one called FuzzDB um, are two projects that give you these lists to use inside of Intruder so you can institute this type of testing yourself. Um, and we showed using lists that were built in the Burp. Uh, these are very similar to those, except for they're open source and free. Uh, so you can go grab this project uh, and throw them into your, your fuzzer or your, um, your Intruder and try to instrument some attacks from lists like this. It really uh, takes the power out of the big, uh, multi-thousand dollar scanner licenses and and brings it to a user who can do it um, on a manual level and and try to uh, get the same kind of coverage for inject, injection text test cases or discovery or anything uh, these lists also contain usernames passwords discovery content there's a whole bunch of different types of lists inside of sec lists um, that you can use uh, for almost anything so i highly recommend you download this project and use it with burp so when do you do like this manual fussing? And so there's a lot of times that people ask me, like, I can't just spend that time to uh, go into every parameter. Um, and so, you know, when you do fuzzing, uh, you know, it takes time. You're going to have to load a list and things like that. And you definitely don't want to, you know, uh, spend all of your time doing manual fuzzing. So uh, there are certain parts of the applications that, that you can recognize by uh, the content or the functionality that uh, you're working with. Inside of the application, you could be, uh, doing a search, which means that most likely uh, on the return, uh, your characters are going to be uh, 
return back to, and that is called reflection. So when you see reflection anywhere in the application, whether it's a search bar or it's you setting up your profile and your profile name that appears somewhere else, these are places where you're going to want to uh, do some kind of testing for cross-site scripting or a, a reflection type bug. Um, if you use any part of an application that is setting account data or, or sending application data to the server that's going to most likely require a database check for them to check their database for something, that would be a place where you want to fuzz for a SQL injection. And so as you work inside of application security testing, you get a feel for you know applications and their functions and where to fuzz. Now, there's also some other conditions where you might want to fuzz. So if you've already elicited an error, like a MySQL error we see here, this might be a good candidate to uh, manually fuzz or, or use Intruder to um, send a, a list out and see if there's uh, some type of syntax in there that can generate a more meaningful attack error. Obviously, you want to manually test for this first, but if you're getting stuck, you can, you can do that way. Uh, again, parameters that you think deal with the database query or you have a hunch or vulnerable, uh, manual test first, and then uh, you can also use Intruder to institute um, the fuzzing through Intruder with uh, you know, either a set list inside of Burp or something like Seclist or FuzzDB. Um, when you know the source and you're going to uh, check, check that, and you know there's a vulnerability there, maybe through a source code auditing tool, and you're trying to go back, maybe you're a developer, and uh, you have the source code, or maybe the pro project is open source, and you know there most likely is a vulnerability there, but you can't exactly exploit it. Um, or when you're doing regression testing, when you've already found a vulnerability, and then maybe in the future you're going back to see uh, if that vulnerability was actually really patched, or uh, there might be a regression there, and you might be able to find a bypass to the original vulnerability. Remember, these lists don't just have verbatim, um, you know, intruder type attacks in them. Uh, they also have encoded versions of the same thing, so you can bypass things like filters and things like that. Um, so this is. This is kind of a, a workflow for, to understand when to manually test and when to uh, do you know, automated fuzzing using Intruder. There's also this idea of content discovery, um, which we will go to in the recon module. Uh, but when you're spidering, you're finding all the leaked content. And um, inside of Burp, uh, you'll find everything that's linked. But there are also resources that are probably not linked inside of the application that you want to instrument. Uh, you know, if you have bugcrowd.com, you might have the index page and some logos and some CSS, and that's all general content that's linked pretty much everywhere. But the admin or the server status page, if those things existed, those are definitely not linked anywhere, and they're definitely things that hackers want to find. So you can do content discovery. In fact, there's a pro tool to do content discovery inside of Burp that allows you to uh, basically add your own content discovery lists or use ones that Burp has already uh, built into the tool. Um, but content discovery is definitely something you can also use Intruder for um, and use lists inside of things like uh, Seclist or FuzzDB. So we're going to take a look real quick at uh, content discovery. Content discovery uh, is a pro feature built inside of Burp, but it's one of these engagement tools we mentioned very briefly early on. If you have the pro version of, of Burp, uh, and the engagement tools allow you some more helpers inside of the actual program. Now, content discovery is one. Uh, it does that idea of finding non-linked content for you. Um, you can set it up on a domain. Uh, you go into your target, into your sitemap. Site map. You can right-click on the domain and then choose engagement tools, discover content. And then you get uh, a basic window pop-up that says, let's check for what do you want to check for? Uh, files and directories, files only, um, or directories only. How recursive do you want the tool to be after it finds something? Do you want it to then to start over? off of that path and try to find more things. Um, what list do you want it to check for? It has some built-in ones, or you can specify uh, your own. And then what file extensions do you want the content discovery tool to go out and use? So these are pro tools. Um, they are useful. Um, there are a lot of tools out here in the, uh, in the application security testing scene um, that do content discovery. And um, although I like content discovery, um, I actually use a different tool for this in my workflow, which I'll talk about in the recon and discovery module, uh, but this does exist. There's also other helpers inside of the engagement tools menu, things that allow you to search for a regex or a string across all of your tools. Um, instead of just each individual one, you can search for anything across all of them. You can pull out all the comments, all of the scripts, you can find references, and then analyze target is probably one of the most useful ones, um, which we'll discuss in a later burp uh, module. 
So this is an example of doing content discovery with Intruder. You can see on the left-hand side, we have our site map under target, and we've selected uh, the slash right there behind the right-click menu, sorry about that. And uh, we can right-click on the slash, which is the root resource for the application, and say send to Intruder. And that pops up an Intruder attack under our Intruder tab, and it's number two. And if we look at the positions that we're gonna set again with Intruder, um, we can add payload markers after the slash and two of them. And this is indicating where we're gonna put in our list values. And we're gonna use a list from Seclis or, or somewhere else to um, try to request resources off of the root slash. And so we will go ahead and add a custom list under payloads and you would take this all the way to its conclusion. And then you would run this type of intruder attack to do uh, this discovery. And then you would sort uh, you would sort the content length and the response codes of that finished intruder attack to see if you found any legit content you need to uh, follow up on. All right, so for this introduction to Burp Suite module, we're going to leave you with one more lab example that we're going to go over here. And we're going to do uh, one more thing from Umbrella Corporation. We're going to show you the power of something like Intruder and maybe another tool inside of Burp like Sequencer, which we haven't discussed yet. And we'll discuss in later modules about Burp. All right, so now we're going to look at Umbrella Corp internal here. Um, we're going to exercise one more lab to show some of the uh, other features that you can use. here. And so uh, we have a whole bunch of high level menus here. Uh, this is a CTF app for uh, beginners, uh, people who have never really done application security before. Uh, so there's a hundred, hundred of hidden flags inside of Umbrella Corp internal. Um, but for this instance, we're going to go to some of the, uh, some of the pages. And here on the Alpha Team System page, uh, we get a link here. It says, welcome to Alpha Team Systems. ATS has moved locations to this URL. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and indeed copy this URL and paste it inside of my browser. Now you can see um, that I get to a page, but it says access denied, IP and role recorded. Um, you can see that in my proxy HTTP history, I did indeed request this for page and all I got back with the content was a. Uh, favicon icon and uh, this default response here. Um, but uh, if you look in the response here, you can actually see that uh, I was set uh, a cookie um, and, uh, and also another header called stars when I visited this page. And so here, uh, this might be interesting to look into. Now, not all cookies that are built into platforms or anything like that are gonna be uh, easily uh, reversed or anything like that. In fact, a lot of the ones that come with the default frameworks are not even worth really checking. But there are some utilities inside of Burp, like Burp Sequencer, um, that we can use to analyze uh, these types of functions. And so uh, we're gonna walk through doing that right now and I'm gonna show you how that works. Uh, so here we have the request that went to the main page and the response where it set cookie UUID something here. And uh, if I go ahead and refresh this a couple times and send it to repeater, I say go, I can see that it set the cookie here, set the cookie again. And if I send a couple of these, I start to notice that it looks roughly the same. Um, there are some minor changes in this cookie that it's setting, but there are also are some that maybe, uh, maybe are only changing or large portions that are not changing. Uh, so what I wanna do here is, is see if I can enumerate um, what is actually random about this cookie and what is not random about this cookie. And then it looks like the stars one stays static for, for everything. Now, uh, what I wanna do here is, uh, is I'm going to take this request and send it to Sequencer. Sequencer is gonna light up here. Sequencer is a tool inside of Burp that allows you to uh, request a whole bunch of usually cookie or, uh, or unique values from a page and then do some analysis on them. So, uh, it'll do kind of what Intruder would do here. It would it will take uh, it'll take this request, send it a bunch of times, um, and then extract the value of all of the cookies that it sets for us. And you can see it already does some analysis on what it thinks it wants us to um, to pull from all of these requests. Here you can see um, select the location in the response where the token appears, and it is indeed this UUID um, token that we want to we want to check out. And so uh, here's the request. That's fine. Um, we can choose some options, but when I press start live capture here, it's going to request a whole bunch of, of these tokens. It's going to do that web request that we just saw that gave us the token, write down the token that returned, and it's going to give us a list so we can analyze uh, what that is. So if we go start live capture here, you can see it brings up a window uh, and it starts uh, basically requesting uh, hundreds of these. And you can stop it now 
um, and then just say stop whenever you're ready. I'll pause, stop. Let's say, oh no, actually we want to analyze now. So once you've requested a couple of these or a thousand of these, you can say analyze now. Now what this will do is is basically uh, it'll do character level level analysis and, uh, and a whole bunch of analysis on the entropy of this token. And the overall entropy of this token is very low. Um, if you go to the bit level analysis, you can see that, uh, you know, there are some positions in the string which uh, are less uh, random than others. Um, and there's a whole bunch of information you can use inside of Sequencer. Um, but I'm going to show uh, one of the easiest ways to identify this. And we already kind of identified it using repeater that we noticed that things weren't weren't changing a lot is I'm going to um, copy all the tokens, choose this button up here, and I'm just going to use a simple text pad for uh, for uh, learning sake. So I'm going to go ahead and paste all of the tokens that all thousand that Bert found, right? And uh, let me make this bigger for you guys. And now that this is bigger, uh, we can just use the the scroll function in the text pad here to see uh, that indeed there are some areas where this is completely static, and there are other areas that are changing. And we can see that uh, the areas that are changing are the last, uh, the last number on the first set, uh, this number on this set, and the last number of the whole string. So these are changing. If we scroll up and down, we can see that also those are only changing to numeric values. And so um, what we want to do is, if this is some type of uh, access control, we want to see if maybe uh, we can brute force those three characters. Um, and so we're going to use Intruder to do that. So we can go ahead and close out of this, out of Sequencer. That just allowed us to request a whole bunch of, of those tokens just to get a feel for it. And we're going to go back to Proxy tab. Now this was the request um, that, uh, that sent back the cookie. And now when we make a request to the uh, favicon ICO, um, we have the cookie you know, set. We go to uh, our scope. We go to uh, here. If we go to this site and we add it to scope, we'll be able to see it inside of our site tree now. And here it is indeed. We'll uh, close up Umbrella Corporation, open here. Uh, and then we have a request to the root to robots.txt. And there's some static. Um, so, what I want to try to do is. Uh, is request this with uh, the cookie set, and we will try to instrument that ID. So uh, if we see any of these requests where the cookie has been set right here, this is that line. And I'm going to copy this. And then I'm just actually going to send this to Intruder. So I'll send this one to Intruder. And then uh, make sure this is correct. This is the address. If I go to positions, um, I can see here is that request. And it automatically knows, you know, like Burp Intruder tries to magically know where we're going to uh, do some type of intruder-based attack. It has already marked the whole cookie for maybe fuzzing of some sort, but we don't want to do that right now. We're going to say clear. Now, um, I want to request the root resource, not the favicon ICO file, so I'm going to delete. I just want to do get, and I want to see what happens when I go to the root resource um, with a different cookie. And so here, uh, I have the cookies been set by the application, and I know from uh, my text pad uh, that uh, certain areas in this cookie um, are the ones that are changing. So it's the last numeral on the first set. So that's this six here. And I know that this is going to be one of the places that I want to iterate. So I'm going to choose add a payload marker there. And then I also know that uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven characters in on the last string. Uh, which will be this one, is also one of the ones that's iterating. And then the last character on the total string is also iterating. So I've add, added three sets of uh, payload markers for this attack. Now I'm going to go ahead and choose Cluster Bomb again um, as my attack type. And now I'm going to set up my payloads. So I know that uh, each one of these parts of this session ID or cookie or whatever it is, uh, it's actually a cookie um, with this UUID value. Uh, it just by looking over this is uh, is a numeral. It's not uh, iterating through a alphabetic character, uh, alpha alphabetical character either. Uh, so for my first payload, 
set, I'm going to use a different payload type than we've used in the past. I'm going to use um, numbers. And if I choose numbers, now I get a different menu for the payload options. And what I'm going to do is, is I want this to request everything from zero uh, to nine in this first space uh, and counting by ones. And so I can set that one. And then I want to do the same thing for the second one. So now I'm on the second payload. And I also want this to be a number based payload. This is zero to nine, step one. And then for the third one, I want to do the exact same thing. Choose simple list numbers, zero to nine, step one. So this will create about a thousand requests in each different place iterating through zero through nine with all different possible combinations. Um, so let's go ahead and start this attack. You can see burp is running. Remember, if you're using the free version of Intruder, this attack will take quite some time. And we've finished all possible combinations. Uh, so uh, we can shorten these payload columns a little bit so we can view the data a little bit better. Um, but most of the time when we request something, uh, the root resource with the uh, with a cookie that uh, doesn't really do anything or doesn't have any access, um, normally we're getting back uh, what looks like uh, 1554 in the length area and then a status of 200. Now, um, because I've iterated through all of these, I can sort this length. And then I can see that uh, there is a different content length, or maybe there could have been a set, but really it looks like I've just triggered one, um, a combination of characters uh, that looked like this. And so uh, the four, the three, and the three were all instituted um, as numbers inside of uh, this, and it returned a different content length. So if I go to response uh, and scroll down here, um, you can see that I've actually brute forced uh, a UUID or a token of some sort. Um, and gained access to the admin's uh, flag or the admin's uh, page. So uh, because this is a CTF app, uh, there's a flag uh, inserted there. So this is just a sample of, of how you can use Intruder in a different way with a number-based payload. And, um, and we'll talk about more advanced ways to use Intruder, um, also more advanced options of filtering your output in the intermediate burp suite class. Thanks for sticking with us through our introductory to Burp Suite module. Uh, for next time, we do have more discussion of sequencer, extender, decoder, and some of the other options uh, that configure these tools. Uh, we'll talk about more use cases of how you use Burp to do different things like link discovery um, and uh, some configuration options for Spider. Uh, we'll also talk about use cases inside of Scanner and how you edit scan policies and retries and uh, large scale uh, scanning across large targets, uh, more stuff with repeater and intruder, uh, basically payload encoding and grepping at and filtering and fuzzing best practices uh, and some other project options. But uh, we will see you next time. And thank you so much for watching Bug Crowd University.